Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation. We invite you to sit back and enjoy some science from your sofa. I'm Amy Leitman, president of NTM Info and Research, and I will be moderating tonight's Q&A session after our presentation by Dr. Kevin Winthrop. Dr. Winthrop is a professor of public health, infectious diseases, and ophthalmology at Oregon Health and Science University. He's a former staff infectious disease epidemiologist at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in their division of tuberculosis elimination. He has co-authored over 225 publications, many de detailing the epidemiologic and clinical aspects of NTM, tuberculosis, and other infections associated with rheumatic disease and biologic immunosuppressive therapies. Clinically, he provides regional consultations for mycobacterial diseases and other chronic chest infections and serves as medical consultant to the Oregon Public Health Division's TB control program. His Center for Infectious Disease Studies has served as the lead institution and coordinating center for multiple cohort studies and clinical trials. He has served as the primary or senior investigator in many of these clinical and epidemiologic studies and frequently collaborates with the pulmonary department on studies related to bronchiectasis. He founded the NTM Research Consortium and Associated Clinical Trials Network, which facilitate collaborative multi-site grants and clinical trials among patients with NTM. He is a member of the graduate faculty at OHSU where he mentors public health students, medical students, and physicians in postgraduate training. Tonight, after our presentation, you'll be able to ask questions of Dr. Winthrop using the Q&A function. You look for this little Q&A box down at the bottom and it'll open this box here. You type your question at the bottom and then press send. Your question will answer the queue and I will read as many questions as we can get to tonight to our speaker and so he can answer them. Don't miss our upcoming presentation on March 23rd on the lung microbiome featuring Dr. Segal and Dr. Wu from the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and find our YouTube channel, which has all of our previous presentations from our conferences and webinars. And you can also learn more about us and sign up for the latest news at ntminfo.org. Dr. Winthrop, I'm handing it over to you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Great, thanks, Amy. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for your collaboration and support in the NTM scientific space for the last decade or more. And uh, I'm gonna give a plug for the microbiome um, thing you're doing with uh, the NYU guys. I love what they're doing there. Super hot science, really interesting. So I may, I may join that one uh, to listen if you don't mind. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity just to talk to you and uh, your peeps, uh, NTMIR folks, about um, hypertonic saline. So let me share my screen here. I think you can see my screen. Um, hypertonic saline and pulmonary MAC question mark. So uh, that's the title and it sums up the talk. The, the talk, I, I don't know. I will be 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And then I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. I mean, I, I have more questions than answers with this topic, which was the nature of uh, the grant that we were very happy to receive from NTM IR uh, to study this question. Uh, a lot of patients I know are using hypertonic saline. Uh, some patients are using uh, isotonic saline or regular saline or normal saline. Uh, some people aren't using any. Uh, it's always been kind of one of those open questions about whether it does anything good and what are the benefits. Um, it's a hassle, it takes a lot of time. I mean, there, there's pros and cons to these type of um, therapies. Uh, so I want to get into some of those things. I want to show you the data that we have today behind it. And then I want to just tell you what we're doing uh, to collect some data uh, together uh, with you. Uh, and um, see if we can answer some of these questions. So uh, some disclosures, Inzmed uh, and actually several other companies now that are in the uh, NTM space, Spiro and Paratech, uh, as well as you know funding from a variety of sources, including NTM, NTM IR, as well as other nonprofits, NIH, PCORI, et cetera. So luckily uh, a lot of people are getting interested in NTM because it's, uh, it, it's, 
we should be interested in it. So uh, as you guys know, and I don't need to review a lot of this for, for many of you, many of you have had NTM before or have had it persistently and you're, you're uh, really what I call pros at dealing with it. You, you know what you're doing, you've had it a long time, you manage your disease uh, extraordinarily well sometimes um, and sometimes, sometimes not. So that's where hopefully people like me can help you from time to time uh, when you need it. So, so a quick review of what it is and then you know, launch into the, the hypertonic uh, and uh, saline discussion. Um, we used to call these mycobacterium other than tuberculosis or MOT, M-O-T-T. Uh, then we called them atypical tuberculosis or atypical mycobacterium. And then finally we settled on this term non-tuberculous mycobacterium. So I think NTM is probably here to stay as the acronym. There are some people that call them EMs or environmental microbacterium, uh, but I, I think we're gonna stick with NTM. Why, why EMs or environmental microbacterium? Of course, because they're in the environment, as all you know, uh, they're in the water and uh, including the, the municipal water systems of most places on the planet, uh, lakes, rivers, uh, brackish waters and, and soil. So we know this stuff blows around on uh, dry days when, when soil is being kicked up by um, the wind. Uh, these bugs live in biofilm, and that's important to understand. It's not just the biofilm of the pipes, but also the biofilm within the airway, particularly damaged airways of bronchiectasis. So these bugs uh, can hide out in those areas, um, and um, they can also live with other bugs like Pseudomonas and Legionella. They can live inside amoebas. Uh, so they, they know how to hide from the immune system, they know how to hide from antibiotics, they know how to um, really kind of shield themselves from the environment. So roughly we divide it into slow growers and rapid growers. growers. So the slow growers are MAC uh, that most of you are familiar with, Mycobacterium avium complex. Some of the lesser common species in the U.S. to cause disease are Kansasii and Zenopi, a marinum causes extra pulmonary disease. It does not cause pulmonary disease. Uh, the rapid growers are really important, particularly Mycobacterium abscessus. That is the number two cause of pulmonary NTM in the country, about 80 to 85% is MAC. Uh, and then most of the rest is abscessus. Um, I made a joke there years ago that we have 100 plus species in growing. It's because we have too many PhD candidates because everyone who was doing a PhD would go dig up a new species in their backyard and they'd sequence it and see that it's a little different. And so they'd name it, you know, Mycobacterium uh, backyardii or something like that. And we'd have a new species. So we actually now have over 200 species. Um, although I was just on a webinar with Chuck Daly and David Griffiths and we were talking about this. I mean, uh, of the 200 plus species, probably only about 10 are important in terms of causing pulmonary disease. Sure, there's some isolated cases, uh, very rare cases of, you know, uh, X, Y, and Z, or this, that, and the other thing, super rare um, bugs that, you know, last names are hard to pronounce. Uh, but, but suffice to say, behind MAC and Obsessus and Kinsasia and Zenopi, th there's a handful of others that really we see as disease causers. So keep that in mind. Um, we know a couple things. This is Oregon data. We had the luxury of having the entire population, um, all the data from Oregon. So we, we weren't missing lab data. We weren't missing any people. We could just see what was happening in the state. Uh, and we found, uh, we found this, about 92% of the pulmonary cases in Oregon were MAC, uh, with 4.2% being abscessus. So that in it alone, those two species were about 95, 96% of the cases. And you can see a, a few other uh, random uh, stragglers alongside there. Um, and then, you know, that first column there on this table is pulmonary disease. So of all the NTM disease in Oregon, 77% of it was pulmonary. So when asked that question, geez, you know, how much, how much, um, what proportion of NTM disease is pulmonary? I always say 77%. That's kind of like it is for TB, where it's about three quarters of all the TB in the world is in the lung. Uh, so uh, not dissimilar there, but, but suffice to say, extra pulmonary TB is very important. And I treat a lot of it. It's, it's less common, um, but those cases can be very, um, very devastating and can be very difficult to treat. Um, 
and sometimes, you know, um, and heavily related immune suppression, but, but not always. So what do we know about incidence prevalence? Uh, and then I'll talk about the, the saline. Uh, this is Oregon data a few years ago, and you can kind of see up above that yellow line, there was um, maybe a hint of increased incidence over time. This jives with some other data uh, that we just published and it was national data showing about a 5.2% increase in annual incidence over the last 10 years, but that was really between 2008 and 2015. This was 2007 to 2012. Um, you know, the nice thing about this paper, again, it was in Oregon, we had, we had all the data for the whole state and it was actually the first paper ever, to my knowledge, to figure out what the annual instance was of pulmonary NTM in the population. We had some prevalence papers where you kind of look at a population and say, well, how many cases are there right now? But, you know, no studies where they say, where you answer the question, how many new cases are there each year? So that's what instance is, new cases each year. So at the end of 2012 in Oregon, population-wide, we were having 4.8 per 100,000. Now, I think it's a little higher than that. Uh, and when we look nationally, like I told you in this other publication, uh, we are getting closer to six uh, per 100,000. And the other thing I'll point out in the next slide here is that uh, it's clearly age dependent. So you can see in the age groups below age 50 on the left-hand side of the slide, they're in the zero to 49 year old category. There's very little disease. Um, most of this is, uh, these are, are patients with cystic fibrosis or a few other uh, rare inherited lung diseases. Uh, but, and there's a few other things in there, but, but suffice it to say 95% plus of the disease is 50 and over. And you can see a slight pre preponderance uh, toward females being more likely to have disease, particularly after age 60. So actually before age 60 is slightly more males than females, but pretty equal. And as you go in age, you see increasingly uh, a higher proportion of disease in females, but still it's not that much different. It's maybe almost 55% female or 60% female and the rest male. Uh, here's the US instance paper I was mentioning, and you can see this 5.2% annual increase over time. This was, was, was most marked in women and most marked in those over age 65. This is the age 65 uh, line, the top line on that, uh, that figure or the graph that I'm showing. And so you can see the instance of someone over 65 in the year 2015 was about uh, 18 per 100,000 patient years. So that's a lot higher than, than people um, under age 65, which is down at the bottom of that figure where it's uh, about two per 100,000. So clearly uh, increased risk with increased age. And then the, the figure to the right is a map, of course. And you can see that you know some of these states are darker than others and the darker, the higher incidence. The Southeast it tends to have the highest incidence in the US and that's kind of always been the case, but I'll point out the Northwest is pretty similar instance. And even the arid intermountain states, Montana, Idaho, I was surprised uh, in South Dakota had fairly high incidence. And I, I don't know why that is that uh, David Griffiths was just asking me that in this webinar, other than, um, you know, these are not very populated states. So you just need a couple cases there and you get pretty high incidence estimates. So I suspect, um, you know, the, the confidence intervals around what the true instance is are much larger in those places where there's less population. So um, do I think the risk is the same in Montana as Hawaii? No, I don't. I think the risk is much higher in Hawaii um, where the instance is much, uh, which is really the highest in the US. But anyway, I think it's important to look at the map. I take it with a grain of salt, but certainly certain places seem to have more disease than others. Some of that has to do with the environment. Some of that has to do with the, the types of people living there. So there's really two disease types uh, in, um, to summarize this quickly, there is the smoking related lung disease, more the emphysema and COPD type. It's more common in men, although it obviously occurs in females as well, more likely associated with a cavity 
um, it tends to be more rapidly progressive. There is the other form of disease, which is more common in uh, women, but obviously uh, also occurs in men, uh, and it is associated with bronchiectasis. Now, I, most of these people, I think, probably have bronchiectasis to start, and they then acquire MAC, but there is no question it goes the other way around as well. Um, the, and I think it's underappreciated. I think MAC causes bronchiectasis in a large proportion, in a larger proportion of these patients than we've recognized before. That's my opinion. Um, anyway, most of these patients tend to be uh, thin, sometimes tall, sometimes having uh, some scoliosis and other findings, but in, in the males and females look fairly similar in this way. This is a classic CT scan. And on the, on, um, the left-hand side of your screen is the right uh, lung, actually, it's reversed. And you can see all this white stuff and some big black circles. Those are those dilated bronchiectatic airways and all the white stuff. Um, is um, is junk, gook, gunk, whatever you want to call it. It's it's biofilm. It's uh, mucus impacted in airways. Uh, it's Mycobacterium avium and a, and a bunch of other uh, bugs. Um, I kind of already said this already, but just what are those underlying lung architectural abnormalities that put you at risk for NTM and bronchiectasis is obviously. Uh, a very, very important risk factor. And again, those are dilated airways. Bronchial is Latin for tube. And ectasis is Greek for stretched out. So it's like a stretched out dilated air tube. Um, you see that condition in cystic fibrosis. And of course, you see it outside of cystic fibrosis. Prior TB or other infections can damage the airway and cause bronchiectasis. Other inherited disorders like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency um, is another classic example of something that causes bronchiectasis. And then of course, emphysema and uh, smoking related lung disease being important. And I'll also just mention GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, certainly in some individuals, this is an issue that people do have reflux and aspiration of mycobacterium from their stomach into their airway. Uh, and lastly on the side, again, I just mentioned um, the environment, I, that's a whole nother uh, talk on its own, but, but we do know that you know, exposure to water and soil sources in various ways, shapes or form can introduce NTM into the airway. And I'll just mention this because I always mention it. Um, we and others have done a number of studies on immunosuppressant uses uh, and uh, immunosuppressant use and its influence on NTM risk. And there's a number of studies listed here on the slide looking at both oral prednisone as well as, as, well as inhaled corticosteroids uh, showing, and, and these are very commonly used and probably a lot of you use them. Um, they certainly have a role in the management of uh, reactive airway disease and COPD, but they do increase the risk for NTM and I do try to get people off of them when possible. So that's the background. Now let's talk about uh, airway hygiene. You see um, a bunch of pictures here and I will say we use this word airway hygiene or um, airway clearance. These, these words and phrases are kind of interchangeable for um, trying to remove the buildup of uh, mucus, sputum, and um, organisms that, that are you know, occurring in these damaged parts of the lung. And uh, we have various ways to do this. Some of these are positive expiratory devices, like in the lower right hand here, you see the acapella valve where you blow on it and it puts positive pressure back in your airway and kind of vibrates your airway and helps knock some of that stuff off the airway wall so you can then cough it out. Uh, the vest is here also shown. It does the same type of thing. Again, it vibrates those airways and helps you cough stuff out. Now, one thing you can also do then is inhale hypertonic or isotonic saline. And the question is, what does that do for you? Uh, the idea of kind of washing your airways out with a viscous um, solution uh, seems to make sense. I think intuitively that, that you know, you scrub your body down with soap and water. I mean, if, or you brush your teeth at night, if you could somehow brush your airways out uh, with some soap or some, uh, you know, uh, what did uh, the ex-president say? You know, bleach or Lysol, I forgot what he promoted, but, but, but you know, suffice to say, if you could actually get in there and debride like you do with your teeth and your toothbrush and remove that biofilm, 
uh, you could um, you know, remove organism, remove MAC or other NTM, uh, and also just clean your airways out. So we obviously don't have a lung scrubber brush and we can't do that, uh, but we do have the, the positive extra pressure devices and the, the vests, this vibration idea. And then we do have the washing out idea with the saline. So what do we know about saline? I'll just say that it, it comes in really two forms or three forms. There's isotonic or normal saline there's 3% saline and then there's like 7% saline. Um, and obviously you can make whatever percent saline you, you want. Um, isotonic just means it's got the same, uh, basically it's 0.9% uh, sodium content or concentration. And that's about the same that's in your body's uh, secretions and cells like your tears and your saliva and all these things have about that percent in it. So when you put that solution next to one of your cells, there's no fluid going um, across that barrier. I don't know if you remember your experiments back in high school where you take the, you take the, the aquarium or the, you know, the aquarium and you put really a salty solution on one side and then you put a membrane uh, or some sort of semi-permeable barrier. And then you put like, you know, just plain water on the other side. And what, what happens? Well, they mix, right? Because the, the water wants to um, basically spread itself out so that the, the concentration of sodium is the same in both chambers, you know, across the entire aquarium. So that was the classic experiment that, I don't know, I remember doing years ago in high school, but that's the concept here. And then when you have isotonic saline, the concentration of sodium is the same in both chambers. So there's really no net transport of water. So the idea is when you inhale something that's hypertonic, so it has a higher concentration of um, sodium, you're gonna pull water out of your the, the cells alongside that saline in order to basically lower the, the, the sodium concentration in the saline. So it basically pulls water out of the cells and then the idea is in it, it makes it easier to cough your sputum out. So rather than being that dried, sticky sputum that's tough to liberate, uh, this would give you a more, um, I guess, a more lubricated, uh, higher volume type sputum that you can actually remove and get out. So that's the idea behind it. So what do we know about it? So this is data from cystic fibrosis and this is where it was first shown you can see it's a pretty big study. I'll just show you at the top, there was 81 people who were controls and there were 81 people who were given hypertonic saline. And what you can see is um, the, actually the hypertonic saline seemed to really help. So this was improvement in pulmonary function tests. Um, pulmonary function tests looking at your force vital capacity on top and your force expiratory volume on bottoms. So your force vital capacity is really, you know, how, you know, how much can you um, inhale? You know, how how much air can you actually get into your airway? And on the bottom, the FEV or expiratory volume is how much can you exhale? How much? How easy for? Uh, how easy is it for you to get the air out? And of course, you need to do both. You need to get it in, and you need to get it out when you're breathing. So. Um, what this showed was th these cystic fibrosis kids did better. They could breathe in more air and they could actually breathe it out better. So this, this is the hypertonic saline on, uh, line on top and the measure of function on, on the left-hand side or the y-axis of the graph. And you can see the control line is lower. So not a ton different, but, but definitely um, different to the eye you can see uh, for both of these measures. Uh, what else was encouraging about that data? That, that, this is a New England Journal paper. It was a seminal paper in 2006 and really put hypertonic saline on the map for cystic fibrosis. And they showed that the kids on hypertonic saline were more likely uh, to, to be exacerbation free, meaning they didn't have a flare up and need to have antibiotics. So at the end of the 48 week period, 76% of the, the kids on hypertonic hadn't had an exacerbation uh, as compared to 62%. So it did show that it was protective against 
flare ups of bugs, you know, rearing their ugly heads and, and, and causing an exacerbation. Uh, what was also interesting about this data though, when they looked at the kids with pseudomonas and pseudomonas is something probably many of you have, it's a gram negative bug that often inhabits damaged airways. Um, it likes to live alongside MAC, although they compete with each other. And we often uh, find MAC, pseudomonas kind of goes, goes down or goes away. And then, you know, alternatively, when MAC goes down, you know, pseudomonas might take advantage of that and kind of rear up. We see these kind of two guys duking it out in this ecosystem, um, you know, over time. But interesting here is that the hypertonic saline didn't seem to change the amount of Pseudomonas or staff oris, which is another bug that, you know, 30 or 40% of people carry in their airway. And it is a problem for patients with bronchiectasis because it does cause flare ups. And you can see in these graphs, I don't need to go through them really, but you just see the, the hypertonic saline line and the control line is basically the same for all of these over time. And these were different measurements of density of staph or Pseudomonas. So it didn't really seemed to be detrimental to those two bugs. It didn't seem to kill them, it didn't seem to change their concentration, which um, is kind of too bad. I would love for it to decrease their concentration, but again, it's just one study, but I think it was, it was fairly uh, important finding from this study. I will point out the other important finding is just that, you know, inhaling hypertonic saline is not like air. Um, you do have some increased um, reactions to it. It promotes cough. It promotes sputum production. So some people report cough, chest tightness, pharyngitis, sore throat. Um, it might promote hemoptysis a little bit. It, it can be irritating. So, you know, some people might have a small amount of blood in their sputum periodically. So there's no question that you're actually inhaling something. And, and I think probably the 7% is uh, is harder to tolerate than lower percentages. And I'll get to that uh, in just a moment. So what about non-CF uh, bronchiectasis? So um, this is a nice paper that was actually just recently published. And it looked at the studies of what's called a meta-analysis. And it looked at all the studies on this topic and then put the results together for us to see. So uh, up above here, this is the data with regards to your force expiratory volume, your, your FEV1, which I showed you before, it's one of your polymer function tests. How much air can you get out in a certain time? Um, and you'll also see just the left of FEV1 are four different studies here published over the last 10 years or 15 years. And, and so that's the first point. There's only four studies in the last 15 years. Uh, that have looked at this. In, in non-CF bronchiectasis, there are only four studies that have compared the, the idea of inhaling isotonic saline, so 0.9%, versus hypertonic saline, which is 7%. Um, and I'll also point out that they're very small studies with very few patients, so we don't have a whole lot of data. But you can see here that, that the estimate for whether it made a difference or not is all kind of over zero. So it kind of favors the idea that, um, that you know, there's, there's probably no difference uh, between isotonic and hypertonic when it comes to non-CF bronchiectasis and FEV1. Uh, we didn't see a whole lot of change in these studies, whether someone was on, on it, on hypertonic or isotonic. Um, the same thing was true with sputum volume. You can see this big black, this is the summary statistic or estimate, which basically just shows you, you're right in the middle, that there was really no difference in these studies, whether someone was inhaling isotonic or hypertonic, they didn't seem to have a benefit now, or a difference in benefit. Now, now just remember, this is not versus nothing. This is isotonic versus hypertonic. So, so both groups of people are actually doing something here with saline. Um, now, not all the studies have shown this in each domain. This is actually a quality of life domain using the St. George Respiratory Questionnaire. And these investigators, and this is one of the studies that I just highlighted in the, the meta-analysis. You can see it, the Kellett 2005 study. 
um, in the Kellett 2011 study. This is the 2011 study that they also published in follow-up. And this actually suggested that, that the patients on the hypertonic uh, felt better. Their, their pulmonary function test might not have been different, which doesn't surprise me at all, actually, because we don't see a lot of change in pulmonary function tests with non-CF bronchiectasis like we do in CF. CF is completely different in that regard, where pulmonary function tests go up and down, up and down. In non-CF bronchiectasis, we see stability over time, uh, much, you know, much more so relative to CF. So um, these investigators really focus on quality of life. And what they showed was that, that both symptoms and overall improvement activity and, and, um, and other factors were, were more beneficial in those inhaling hypertonic saline versus the isotonic saline. So my sense is that I think in non-CF bronchiectasis, I think there probably is some benefit to the hypertonic relative probably to nothing, although we don't have that data yet, and probably relative to the isotonic. But I will say that this data here also is consistent with what we saw in the CF study I showed you, that there are more side effects, the higher percent of sodium uh, you use. So this top bar on the right here is cough, and you can see the hyper, the hypertonic saline folks up top. There's a larger percentage of people with cough as compared to the isotonic saline, which is on the very bottom. Again, it doesn't surprise me. I'm not sure that's bad. It's not good to be coughing, but it's actually good to be coughing and getting sputum out if you're more productive. So there is some benefit to this uh, side effect. Uh, here was just throat irritation, again, pharyngitis or sore throat, again, more common in the, in the hypertonic as compared to the isotonic. So it's probably one of those, those things. Um, I think someone told me a long time ago, uh, I think it was when I was on my derm rotation decades ago as a med student. And one of the dermatologists said, you know, my rule of thumb is the worse the, the dander shampoo smells, the better it works. So <laughs> I think it's the same thing here. The, the higher the salt, the worse it feels, uh, probably the better it works. Uh, that's my assessment. Um, you know, let's talk about the microbiology just for a second, and then I'll finish by telling you what we're looking at in our study. But um, this is again, suggesting uh, a different study, suggesting relatively little difference in actually quality of life. So the SGRQ, so this is a, against the study I just showed you, where here you see a difference in that hypertonic is uh, associated with better outcomes than isotonic. Well, this was a follow-up study uh, around the same time period a year later, which actually showed no difference over time between those two groups. And this is the SGRQ on the left. And this is another thing called the, the Leicester cough questionnaire, um, something they use primarily in Europe and they didn't see a different either. But what I think is most important here and what I wanted to show you was at the bottom that no matter what group these people are in, whether it was isotonic or hypertonic, they seem to have a decrease in the percent of cultures that were positive. And what I mean by positive culture is it could have been anything, staph, pseudomonas, acromobacter, alkaligenes, whatever. It could have been a number of bugs. And when they started this study, about 60% in each group were positive. Um, and when they finished the study at 12 months, only 15% of people had sputum positivity. So it did kind of suggest, contrary to the CF study I showed you before, where it didn't affect pseudomonas or staph, here in non-CF bronchiectasis, it did seem uh, to maybe uh, affect the actual microbiome and the bugs living there, and that maybe it's detrimental to some of these bugs. And so more, more recently, and I think very intriguingly, um, there was a dose-dependent effect shown uh, by, this is Jakob von Engen's lab in, in Netherlands, and they were able to look at a number of people who started uh, different saline concentrations. So you have 5.8%, which is basically our hypertonic. You have this 3%, which we can use also here, and then 1%, which is essentially isotonic. And you can see for MAC in the, as well as abscessus, you can see that uh, the higher concentrations and the blue arrows here are pointing to the hypertonic 
you see that the lowest amount of mycobacterial growth uh, for both these organisms occurred with the hypertonic. And you can see some diminishment also with the other percents of mycobacter of, of um, saline with regards to MAC, although for abscessus, they were kind of all the same, whether they were doing nothing, you know, the control or the three or 1%. So um, the hypertonic looked best with both of these. And then for MAC, uh, all of them appeared to be uh, retarding the growth of MAC. So I think there's an idea here that um, this might actually occur in the airway and that the hypertonic uh, solution may be something in which the microbacterium does not thrive. So with that as the backdrop, um, I'll tell you what we're doing. Uh, NTMIR and, and we are, are looking at this together. And um, we are trying to actually answer the question that I didn't really show you any data on, uh, hypertonic saline versus nothing. Um, I think there's a sense that hypertonic saline and isotonic saline probably do about the same thing. Uh, but maybe there's some other benefit with the hypertonic in terms of maybe quality of life, uh, but maybe there's this anti-mycobacterial effect of the higher percentages. So I think that that's, that's what we know to date, but I showed you there's only a few studies and there are some conflicting results. Um, so, you know, we, we wanted to really look at the hypertonic versus nothing because a lot of times the patients come in and, you know, what can I do? And I suggest hypertonic saline, um, but it's, it's a hassle. It takes a lot of time. Uh, you've got to sterilize your equipment from time to time or clean it out. Um, you know, it, it's an investment and you got to buy a nebulizer. So, so should I do it or should I not? And that's a big question. So obviously other things are doable and important exercise, aerobic exercise, uh, you, you guys have heard me stress how important that is. And, um, you know, the positive expiratory devices, the flutter valves, et cetera, they can be important. But the question is really, does do spending your time nebulizing uh, hypertonic saline make a difference? So we'd like to evaluate whether the hypertonic saline has an antimicrobacterial effect, similar to the study I just showed you. We want to see if there's clinical efficacy associated with the hypertonic saline, and particularly, does it help people function better? Uh, and we were giving people Fitbits in the study to measure their activity levels uh, and also to see how well they sleep at night. Um, our hypothesis is that, you know, if you have a cleaner airway that you're gonna uh, be more apt to be um, exercising and to be walking more and to actually sleep better. And then finally, to de describe the safety of, of the treatment, similar to the, some of the studies I just showed you. Uh, this is our uh, basically just a graph showing you what we're doing and when, but um, here's the baseline. You know, everyone gets certain things checked, like a culture and some inflammatory markers. The QOLB is a quality of life instrument that we use to measure quality of life. The PROMISE is a survey about fatigue. We measure how far someone can walk in a six minute walk test. And, and then again, like I said, we'll have some Fitbit monitoring during the study. And then of course, we're gonna 12 weeks later kind of compare, measure all those things again and compare them to the baseline. And we hope of course to see improvements. Um, I will say that um, it's a small study. It's meant to be a pilot study. Uh, and you know, if we do see some improvements in some of these measures, our goal would be then to, to obtain a larger grant to do more of a definitive study. And we would have a better idea of what kind of size a study uh, and what exact outcomes to study based on, on this data. So in conclusion, um, I do think there's some evidence in cystic fibrosis of the efficacy with hypertonic saline. It does appear superior to isotonic saline. I think in non-CF bronchiectasis, um, it's a bit mixed. The, most of that data suggests the, the hypertonic and isotonic are roughly similar. Um, there is very mild evidence that both could reduce bacterial colonization, but at least with regards to NTM, the hypertonic, that one study does seem to suggest a better effect with hypertonic saline versus um, isotonic saline. Uh, there's really no data looking at hypertonic saline versus nothing. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and again, I just wanna thank uh, NTMIR for funding the study and I look forward to its results. Um, and 
anything you guys out there can do to help spread word of the study, we'd love to enroll people um, if they're interested. So with that being said, I will stop sharing my, my desktop and uh, happy to take your questions. Thanks. Let me share my screen now again. Looks like we have a lot of, uh, a lot of we questions. We do, and, and I know that um, some of them are, are going to overlap. So I'm going to get to the first one and uh, ask you about hemoptysis because this came up in a number of questions. Um, and I think it's probably something that's important to talk about. You did touch on it briefly that it does um, mildly, um, you know, increase it or it's, it can. Um, and somebody one person asked that they've had bouts of hemoptysis in the past due to having NTM and bronchiectasis. And their question is, would nebulizing with saline cause further bleeds? Um, and then, uh, you know, another person is asking about like the different percentages of saline and is there something, you know, is there a preference or a way to figure out a preference for somebody who's had hemoptysis? Um, so can you, can you comment on any of that? Yeah, you know, that one study I showed you, there was one person who had some hemoptysis. There, there's no question that anytime you put anything into your airway, no matter what it is, you can potentially irritate it. Um, of course, you can get hemoptysis without doing anything either. Um, if you have any sort of inflammation in your airway, if you have bronchiectasis or various infections, um, you know, this happens from time to time. Um, usually when that does happen, I tell people to lay off their hypertonic saline and their, um, their flutter valve or aerobica or whatever they're using for a few days to make sure it resolves and they can go back to it. Um, it's, it's not necessarily of, uh, it's not something I would worry about. I mean, it's almost never of clinical consequence. Um, but obviously we, we tell people if you're getting bleeding and it's frank red blood, you know, bright red blood, um, and particularly if it doesn't stop, you know, you, you bled more than uh, a teaspoon or kind of half a Dixie cup, that's the metric I use, then you need to go to the ER. Um, but that's pretty unusual. And I don't think hypertonic saline would necessarily promote that, so. Okay. Um, thank you. That's, uh, that's very important. Um, there are a number of people wondering how, how they can sign up for the study. <laughs> that <you're Right>. doing. <laughs> well, there are certain inclusion criteria. Um, you, you have to have active disease, meaning you got to have at least two positive cultures um, for, for MAC. Um, and you can't be on any therapies yet. Um, and you can't, you can't be on hypertonic saline yet either. If you've had it already before, then you wouldn't be eligible. So, you know, we really, we want to be really clean about our, our study design and data. And we really want to get people who, um, who haven't been exposed to it before um, and, and to measure, you know, its effect. You know, if we take people who've been on it or off and on it before, then, then they're kind of different potentially than, than people who haven't uh, been on it yet. So, so if, the, if you meet that criteria, uh, yeah, please uh, let me or Amy know and we'll, we'll get you some information for the, the study. Yeah, I was gonna say um, uh, maybe uh, uh, next week, early next week, you and I can uh, talk about getting some information and we can get it up on the website so that people can get the information right from there. Um, and they'll, they'll at least un, you know, know what the criteria are for the study and where to go for more information. Um, somebody has asked, they, were, they said they were using 3.5% hypertonic saline, but um, they switched to a generic 3% uh, saline because the cost was significantly less. And they want to know, is, is that okay? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's going to be really any difference between those two. Yeah, it's okay. And then there are a number of questions on uh, the frequency of inhalation and the time of day. Um, is there a particular number of times per day that somebody should think about inhaling? Is there a particular time of day? Yeah, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the pulmonologists, pulmonologists are intent on twice a day. Um, a lot of it comes from the CF experience where, you know, that's what CF kids do. Um, I don't push that on people. I, I usually ask them to do it once a day when they're doing it. 
and then I asked him to exercise that other session per day. Um, I think there's probably uh, as much or better benefits to that. I, I think exercise is unbelievably important. It helps your immune system. It helps uh, clear your airway. Um, so, you know, I would rather have someone, you know, maybe do the hypertonic in the morning, kind of clear their airway out, and then and then use that more cleared airway out in the afternoon to, to exercise. Um, okay, so somebody else has asked, um, for people with isolated MAC disease, um, does this added moisture um, and aerosolization with hypertonic saline increase the risk of spreading infection from one lobe to another? Um, well, I don't think so. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm hopeful that that uh, tonicity uh, will actually be detrimental to the MAC and might actually retard its growth. Um, and I, I don't think it would promote um, transfer from one area to the other necessarily. Um, you know, theoretically, you're, you know, if you do liberate stuff off the wall, your airway, hopefully you're going to cough, cough that out. Um, even if you, you know, only cough it halfway out, it's, it's not going to like go down a different pipe and then reattach necessarily. I, I don't, I, I don't think so. I just, I think that, I think, again, I think there's probably an antimicrobial effect of the saline itself which would then help kind of mitigate against that kind of idea. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't worry about that. I think, I think most of what you liberate, you're going to, you're going to cough out. Um, somebody else is asking about uh, another question about frequency. They use 7% saline um, and they are using it three times a week, once a day uh, on those days. Is that a frequent enough or yeah, I mean, I think it just depends on the amount of bronchiectasis you have and um, yeah, how productive or how much stuff you feel like you have in there. I mean, I, I have some people that I don't tell to do it at all because A, I don't have any data saying it does anything, hence our need for our study, and B, uh, and some people, they don't have a whole lot of bronchiectasis, so I just don't see the rationale for it. There are other people that have a lot of bronchiectasis, and those are people that I I tend to recommend daily use uh, at least once a day, like I mentioned. Um, and then I think there's people in between that, you know, maybe three or four times a week is great for maintenance and that's probably good enough. So kind of just depends on, on the person. Okay, and then here's another set of questions. Um, is there a limited, is there a minimum amount of time you should nebulize the saline for it to be effective? Um, you know, this person saying that their solution runs out about 15 minutes, but could they do it for a little less time, like five or 10 minutes and still have yeah. it be worthwhile? And the other question they have is, uh, how long should they hold the saline in their lungs before exhaling? And I don't, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think you need to hold it in your lungs. Um, I don't, I don't, it's a great question. Is five minutes good enough? Is 20 minutes better than five or 10? I mean, we just don't know. Um, those are great questions. I, I'll tell you what I think is most important is that um, you do it for, you know, I don't know, five, 10, 15 minutes, somewhere like that. But then you do some positive expiratory device afterwards. You, you should do the vest afterwards or you should blow in a valve um, and I tell people to do those things positionally, like blowing their valve on their back and then on their sides and sitting up and, and really do some purposeful breathing and huff coughing after that. I mean, it's really, these are it, the saline itself is meant to kind of lube stuff up and uh, maybe, you know, get it ready to be knocked off the airway. And so that, that positive expiratory device or the, the vest afterwards really is the next step. And then the coughing is the, the third step. So, so these things should all be done together in that order. So, okay. And that, that actually goes to a question that was posted um, asking about whether the nebulizing saline should be done while doing vest therapy um, or is it more effective to do it with the vest therapy or separate from it? Um, you, you know, again, there's no answer here. No one studied those two alternatives uh, against each other head to head. Um, I guess, you know, I, I think, I don't know, it might not make a difference. My, my sense is that I would at least start the hypertonic for a while uh, before putting the vest on. 
Um, but it might be just the same doing it all together. I mean, certainly it saves you a little time to do it all together. Um, so, you know, I have a lot of patience to do that. I, I think these can be time consuming things and that keeps people from doing it sometimes. So um, it, it may be totally fine to do that. Um, I think obviously if you're blowing on a aerobica or something like that, if that's your vibratory, you know, positive expiratory pressure device, and obviously you do that afterwards. Um, if you have the vest, I guess you could probably uh, do it either way. Um, okay, uh, there, there are still, um, so uh, here's a question that I think should be answered. They're, they're asking about their antibiotic treatment and saline inhalation, using them together. So can you talk about like the order of things if they're using inhaled antibiotics, for example? Yeah, so you'd want to do your inhaled antibiotics afterwards. So like, for instance, the woman I just finished with this afternoon, she, she uses hypertonic, well, she nebulizes albuterol to help open her airway. She then uses the hypertonic to kind of lube her airway up. Uh, she then does the vest or she blows on a valve, she alternates. And then she does her inhaled gentamicin after that. So that would be the order. You, you always wanna do the inhaled antibiotic last, right? You don't wanna wash it out of there. So, so that would be your ordering. Okay. Um, and somebody was asking about what kind of exercise you recommend. And I think you went through um, some of that. Yeah, I mean, it could be anything, but it, it should be aerobic. So it's, it's whatever you like to do and can do physically. And, you know, you need to start with modest goals and work your way up over time. But, but something that gets your breathing up and your heart rate up and preferably something that makes you sweat. I tell people that if you're, if you're not sweating, then... Um, it's, it's not as robust of an exercise. So, um, you know, obviously some people can't physically get to that point and that's fine. You should, you should push yourself as much as you can, but try to get the breathing uh, rate up, try to get your heart rate up. And cause that is, you know, good cardiovascular aerobic exercise. And we have a, a couple of questions actually, actually about the aerobica. Um, there are a couple of people who are asking about um, attaching a nebulizer cup to it. Um, and they're asking, is that just as effective as doing a PEP device afterwards? Well, it's kind of the same idea, you know, doing the vest at the same time you're doing the sailing. So again, it's probably, it probably is. No one's ever, you know, kind of studied the alternative. So I, I don't know that it wouldn't be, I guess in my head, theoretically, it seems like it should probably be fine that way, so. Okay, um, we're gonna scroll through. We have, there's still a long list of questions, so we're gonna. Um, so uh, somebody wants to know about long-term repercussions from using hypertonic saline. They're using 7% saline twice a day for many years. Um, do you know of any particular repercussions or is it just you know how the patient tolerates it? I, I can't imagine, I, I can't even come up with any theoretical <laughs> repercussions. I can't see how salt water would be um, bad for the airway or the body um, in those in those concentrations uh, and for you know, that length of time. So I don't think so. No. Um, we have a few questions asking about uh, mucus sputum productivity. There are some people who are just not as productive, and they want to know: um, Is it still worth you know trying to use the inhaled saline? And is there you know, what other things can they try or include to help, you know, try to produce more sputum? <clears throat> um, say, say that again, sorry. So there, uh, there are a couple of people who are asking about sputum productivity. Some of them are not producing much sputum and they wonder, you know, is it worth them continuing to do the inhalation of saline? Um, and then uh, somebody else is, um, you know, asking, you know, should they add something else like a vest to help with production um, before they do their nebulizer? Like what, what should they do? And is it worth doing if, they, if they're just not usually productive coffers? Yeah. You know, I, I always say, yes, it is worth doing because I think it prevents the buildup of new stuff. So I, I really do think that it makes sense. And I have people do these things, even though they're not bringing up sputum every day because of that, because I know you're inhaling micro 
par particulates every day and uh, organisms of various sorts every day. And I, I think it will help prevent the buildup of that uh, biofilm or that gunk along the airway pipe. So I, I would do it, yeah. Um, here's a, an interesting, a couple of interesting questions. Um, so uh, they're about the beach and the ocean. Um, somebody, one person is asking if they, if they are increasing their risk of activating a dormant MAC infection or like, uh, you know, something I guess that's stable right now and not progressive. Um, if they go to the ocean on vacation and then one person is saying they heard being on a beach is okay and they're wondering if that's true. So um, I guess that's related to the salinity. Yeah, I, I don't think the the beach changes your risk of anything. I mean, some people feel better with that warm or, or just more humid um, air. Um, I have patients who actually feel the opposite as well. So I think it's a you know case by case thing or individualized thing. But yeah, there's no risk to to walking on the beach or being by the ocean. Okay. Um, somebody's actually asked about prednisone. They're asking how it increases risk of NTM. Can you do just a, a briefly address immunosuppressive? Yeah, and I I got to make this my last question because I got to go. But um, okay, thank you. Prednisone diminishes. Um, your white blood cells ability to recognize and attack and kill uh, various pathogens, including mycobacterium. Um, it, it down regulates that whole wing of the immune system with, which deals with those types of infections um, and other infections. So uh, that's, that's how it works in terms of increasing your risk. And uh, that would be true of any steroid compounds. And you know, some steroids are stronger than others and it really ultimately depends on the strength of the steroid and the dose and how long you're using it but but that's how it diminishes your ability uh, your immune system's ability to um, fight these things okay um kevin thank you so much for sharing your time with us we have a bunch of other questions in the queue so we may send a couple of those over to you to get some answers because there are still a few good questions um, so, uh, but thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Um, it's been great to see you and spend time with you. And thank you everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed this webinar and we will see you at the next one. Thanks you guys. Have a great weekend. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kevin.